Okay, Jamie, um, you are all set. Perfect. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Jamie. Um, I am the HIV program coordinator over here in Oakland, California at Asian Health Services. Um, previously, I worked as a uh, clinician pharmacist uh, in uh, Seattle area, rural Seattle area, and um, I actually went to pharmacy school over in Boston. And so I do know uh, Massachusetts and New England very well. Um, and was also involved in um, the API community over there uh, when I was studying. So um, my presentation, um, it's going to be a fairly short presentation um, and it's going to highlight a lot of um, the things that are uh, going on uh, in the API community, uh, specifically regarding HIV, um, along with sharing uh, some parts of my personal story. Um, and so, Leah, next slide. Okay, so the objectives for uh, today, uh, we're gonna first understand the statistical numbers and data for HIV in the API community. Um, then we're going to identify different barriers to accessing HIV care uh, in the API community. And then lastly, to understand cultural differences uh, in the uh, API community. Next slide. Okay. So um, this, it was taken from the CDC. Uh, this is the most recent data that they have. Um, as you can see in um, uh, 2018, uh, towards the end of it, uh, estimated 1.2 million people were living with HIV. Um, of those 1.2, uh, approximately 17.6K were of um, API. Uh, four in five uh, API knew that they had the uh, HIV virus. Okay. Um, in the just some history in the 1980s, uh, annually there were approximately 130K new HIV infections. Um, now there is approximately 34.8K. Uh, new infections per year, and this is throughout uh, the US. Uh, there are many disparities that exist. Uh, most of the uh, disparities uh, exist and are highlighted um, nationally in the Black and the Latinx community. Um, historically with the a API community, because our population uh, in the US is so small, um, there's not a lot of highlight for that. And so when you compare uh, other people with HIV, uh, most API are less likely to have received uh, any form of HIV care. And therefore, um, more work is needed to increase uh, these rates. Um, as you can see on the slide, in 2016, for every 100 Asians uh, or API that are living with HIV, approximately 59 received some HIV care, 47 were retained, and then 54 were virally suppressed. Uh, and so the numbers are not very good there. Um, that's uh, about half. Uh, that were virally suppressed. And our goal is to uh, increase that um, and hopefully achieve 100%. So next slide. Okay. Um, of the 37,968 new HIV diagnosis in the US, um, this was uh, uh, also from the CDC's most recent data um, at the end of 2018, 2% uh, were um, identified as API. Uh, and most of the new diagnosis came from API, gay, and bisexual men. Um, now, that being said, um, a lot of this data is most likely underreported. Uh, and I will discuss uh, why later. 
um, on the right hand side, you have uh, a proportion of people that are living with HIV. Um, and as you can see, um, uh, our Black folks and our Latine folks um, highlight uh, the significant amount of it um, with only our API community. Um, uh, the numbers uh, are supposedly very low. Um, again, those numbers are most likely underreported uh, because of multiple factors. Um, so next slide. So this is just a slide uh, regarding HIV diagnosis among um, adult and adolescent API in the US. Um, as you can see, uh, the younger uh, uh, generations um, have a higher risk, uh, specifically uh, in that middle section of 25 to 34, uh, and then predominantly, uh, predominantly male. Okay, next slide. So, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about API in the US. So in the US, uh, this is as of uh, 2022, there's approximately 20 million people um, of API descent uh, living here. Um, out of the nation's population, API uh, account for approximately 6% uh, of the population. So um, some states with large API populations uh, as you all are familiar, include California, New York, Texas, uh, Florida, Massachusetts, Washington, um, Illinois, uh, Virginia. Um, a lot of people of API descent, their English proficiency is very uh, variable. Um, some countries, uh, for example, such as the Philippines, uh, they use a lot of like English in their language. Mm -hmm. And so they um, have more of an ability to access like healthcare, access, um, uh, access things that uh, other people of API descent, for example, um, Vietnam or Cambodia, um, they don't have um, a lot of English proficiency. And so um, there's a lot of uh, variability there and disparities there. Uh, some income differences uh, do exist in the API community as well. Um, in the East Asian community, so uh, China, Japan, Korea, historically, their income level is significantly higher. Um, and a lot of uh, people who come from East Asian countries tend to be um, middle class, upper middle class, and um, in the higher classes. Uh, versus those of uh, Southeast Asian descent, um, like uh, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, they tend to um, fall under poverty levels. And so uh, there's a lot of barriers there uh, for um, accessing healthcare and accessing HIV care. Same thing with uh, insurances and healthcare differences. Um, I currently live in San Jose, California, and uh, I can tell you that most of the Vietnamese population down there, um, along with most of the population that I take care of in Oakland, um, all of them are Medi-Cal, uh, and they make under $17,000 uh, a year, which uh, falls under poverty level. And so, um, there's a lot of insurance differences and healthcare differences uh, in the API community. Um, and uh, it can vary uh, race uh, with the different uh, Asian races. Okay, next slide. So some one thing that I noticed um, after working all over um, the Northeast, uh, the Northwest, and then here in California, um, is culture of competency um, plays a big factor in HIV care. Um, even though um, when we say Asian Pacific Islander, everyone usually thinks uh, 
oh, uh, they're Asian. Um, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, and it usually uh, most people will think, oh, you're Asian, you must be Chinese. Or, uh, oh, you're Asian, you uh, must be Korean. And so um, most people do not know how to distinguish uh, other Asians apart uh, from each other. Um, there's also different languages in the Asian community. And so unlike the Black community where uh, you do have um, most people that can speak English, uh, a lot of the Asian community cannot. Uh, and so you have people who will request for uh, languages such as Burmese, Cambodian, Indonesian, um, Chinese, and you have to have all of those languages um, interpreted. Uh, there's also different cultures and different styles. Um, each culture is a little bit different uh, in the API community. Um, what uh, goes well for um, a person that has Chinese uh, culture and Chinese background does not necessarily go well with someone who has a uh, Japanese background. And so um, again, uh, making sure that um, clinicians, um, staff members, as well as uh, community members are uh, aware of the different types of uh, Asian Pacific Islander. And then there's uh, disparities among um, API groups, which I have discussed uh, briefly as well. Next slide. So there is a lot of API and um, racism. Um, there also exists uh, racism within the API community. So Asians can be racist um, to other Asians. And so um, with this, we've seen a lot um, unfortunately, because of COVID, because of everything that has happened, um, uh, we see these hate crimes happening in New York, in California, in other states every day. Um, some of these stereotypes uh, that come up uh, are API, our model minority. Um, Basically, uh, we work hard and um, because we work hard, uh, we don't have the same issues that our Black and Latinx folks um, have. Um, we have stereotypes. Oh, uh, APR are very family oriented. They, uh, they don't uh, contract HIV. Um, there's a lot of fetishization, fetishization in the API community. Um, uh, with other races. Um, you have, for example, uh, when I uh, went over to Boston for school, um, I met up with uh, a man who um, uh, it is Caucasian, and he um, basically said, oh, uh, your skin is so smooth, your skin is so soft, um, things like that. And so there's um, a lot of fetishization that happens and um, demasculation that happens because of the way that um, people of um, Asian Pacific Islander descent uh, look. Uh, there's a lot of institutionalized racism. Uh, what that is, is uh, it's organizations that oppress groups of people, for example, um, in certain uh, communities or certain spaces, uh, API uh, LGBTQ folks are denied access to these spaces or resources or valuing um, uh, or certain places value certain cultural norms over another. Um, there's also systemic racism, uh, which is culture fit or shared values through hiring practices or hiring the same leaders or staff, um, which produces racism and um, delegitimizes uh, people's stories. Um, a lot of folk in the API community, especially LGBTQ uh, API have um, medical mistrust and um, some of my patients actually 
uh, especially the ones that use substances, they will not um, want you to call the police if they need, or call 911 if they need help with um, overdose. And so figuring out ways to um, counteract that. Um, in the medical system, um, there's a lot of uh, mistrust because uh, a lot of Asian Pacific Islander folk, um, not just LGBTQ folk, tend to trust more of traditional medicine versus Western medicine. Um, and then again, there's a lot of racism within the API communities ourselves. Um, some I have patients where um, they are Korean and they will not speak to anyone of Japanese descent um, due to uh, the war and like history of colonization. Um, I have patients who are Vietnamese and they do not want uh, anything to do with anyone who is Chinese, uh, again, because of colonization. And so there's a lot of that there um, and making sure that uh, the community and uh, people understand that. So next slide. So we're gonna break some glass. Um, what I mean by that is we're going to break down some um, reasons why uh, people of API descent um, in the LGBTQ community, as well as the heterosexual community um, are not seen um, compared to your black and Latinx folks. So, Historically, we have had low HIV testing rates and or late testing. Um, some of my patients, uh, when I reach out to them and uh, especially of older, uh, my older patients and ask, hey, would you like an HIV test uh, done today? Uh, we usually do it as part of our screening process. Um, they will freak out and they will um, let me know, oh, why do I need that for? I've been monogamous for um, most of my life. Um, I don't need to know about uh, all of that. Uh, I don't want to know um, that if I have HIV because it's a death sentence, okay? Um, there's a lot of unawareness in the community. Uh, I got diagnosed with HIV uh, in the middle of pandemic, uh, June, 2020. And um, my parents, um, they actually said to me, oh, um, do we have to wash uh, our dishes and eat separately now um, because you are HIV positive? Now, I know that um, they mean well, uh, but they don't understand because they don't work in the healthcare system. And so I had to educate them um, for that. There's a lot of stigma uh, with HIV in the API, uh, API community, and usually stigma comes together with shame. Um, when someone is di diagnosed with HIV in the API community, um, what runs through our minds tends to be things like, oh, uh, I have HIV now, I brought shame onto my family. Uh, I have HIV now, um, my friend, like, I can't say anything to my friends and family. I can't hook up or I can't um, have sexual relations with other people of API descent because um, there's, like, they will hate me. They will reject me. Um, and I've had people that have told me that. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, stigma and people in the API community still believe that if you have HIV, you will die uh, within 10 years. Um, and so having to do education around that. Um, the next point is dialogue. So what I mean by dialogue is talking about things like sex, talking about things like uh, fetishes, talking about things like sexual health, talking about mental health, talking about substance use. Um, there is nothing, I will say that there is no such thing as mental health 
in the API community, my parents um, basically told me, oh, you don't need a therapist. Um, and I've had multiple patients tell me that as well. You don't need a therapist. Uh, I don't need a therapist. I can just um, use my will to um, move forward. Um, a lot of uh, API do not have um, talks about sex. It's actually taboo in the culture to even speak about it um, because of uh, culture because of belief um, and because of conservatism. And so um, having to break those barriers and having to bring up those topics uh, can be very difficult. Um, some patients that I have worked with, they still are very hesitant and they will not disclose uh, anything regarding sex. Um, to me, that way I can try and help. Um, linguistics is the next bullet point. So what linguistics is, is um, the different languages. There are many different languages um, in the Asian Pacific Islander community. Uh, for example, Chinese, uh, there's multiple languages for Chinese. It's not just Chinese, it's Mandarin, it's Cantonese, it's Taishanese, it's Fujianese, it's um, uh, there's a, again, there's a lot of different languages, even within one culture itself. And so making sure that there are interpreters or people, um, or staff members that have, um, uh, the ability to speak, read, and write for those languages, along with the inter uh, interpretation and interpreters, some interpreters will also have um, perceived notions of HIV, perceived notions of substance use, perceived notions of mental health, and they will not want to discuss it or they will not interpret it um, with certain patients. Um, I speak Vietnamese, Spanish, and um, uh, I can understand a little bit of Cantonese, and but not enough to do interpretation. I have um, had a call with a patient where I'm discussing HIV, and I can tell that the interpreter is actually omitting things related to talking about HIV, talking about sex. Um, in some of the languages, uh, for example, Vietnamese, uh, there's no such thing as condom. Like there's no such terminology. Um, usually what a condom is when you translate it from Vietnamese to English is um, it's a bag to prevent pregnancy. And so um, understanding that in the language, there's no word that uh, is commonly used to discuss these things. Um, provider bias. Some providers in the API community uh, are very hesitant to discuss things such as HIV prep, uh, HIV PEP, uh, HIV treatments. Um, I've had a lot of the providers um, that tend to be older um, not want to discuss things around uh, sex and uh, sexual uh, positivity. Um, next one is pride. Um, a lot of people who uh, are API and LGBTQ who uh, end up with uh, acquiring HIV, they do not want to tell um, their family members or they do not want to get tested for um, STIs. They don't want to get tested for HIV, things of that nature, because um, they don't want to bring shame to family again. They are prideful in, oh, I um, belong to this diaspora. I don't need to get tested. Um, the next bullet point is acceptance. So uh, along with acceptance comes education. Um, a lot of API community who, or the API community who are HIV positive, they struggle with acceptance. Um, I have had patients who have gotten kicked out of their own home 
um, and threatened to be beat because uh, they acquired HIV. Um, I actually have a patient who is homeless currently um, and living on the streets uh, because um, their family, once they uh, figured out that they were gay, um, they uh, basically said, oh, you are not our son anymore. And so there's a lot of that in the API community. There's, uh, in the API community, a lot of the times you cannot be uh, LGBTQ. You cannot have HIV. You cannot bring shame on your family. Um, Education-wise, uh, having to educate other people um, about things like U equals U, um, about HIV, and HIV is not a death sentence, uh, that you can treat uh, HIV and live a healthy lifestyle uh, and have sex with someone who is HIV negative uh, and not transmit that. Um, that has been a struggle um, as well. Um, there's a lot of gender roles that fall into um, the API community uh, and HIV. Uh, there's an expectation of if you are the eldest son um, and you are gay uh, and you're living with HIV, you still have to um, you still have to get married. You still have to produce, uh, produce offspring, uh, things of that nature. Uh, if you're a woman. Um, you have to uh, stay at home. You have to take care of the kids. Um, you should not be um, outside um, and you shouldn't have HIV. And so there's a lot of that. Um, some of my patients, they have priorities. Uh, some are sex workers, some are uh, massage parlor. Um, uh, some work at massage parlors and a lot of the times, these patients prioritize their need to survive because they don't get paid anything um, over their own health. And so uh, a lot of these patients, they don't seek out health care and treatment for the HIV because they're fighting to survive. What are they going to eat that evening? What are they going to um, do in order to help care for the child. And then the last one is um, their immigration status. And so um, over in Oakland, um, many of our patients are undocumented. And so there are ways to um, move around the system in order to get treatment for these patients. But most people who are of API descent and have HIV and are undocumented, they're afraid to get um, treatment because they're afraid of disclosure of immigration status. They're afraid of um, being detained and then deported back to their country. And so there's a lot of that um, going on. Um, these are just some of the many disparities that uh, people living with HIV uh, who are of API descent face. Um, there's a lot more, uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, open it up in terms of questions because I prefer like discussion style. Uh, and if there's any questions, Leanne, uh, would you be willing to moderate? Sure, absolutely. Leanne, I'll help you with that too. This is Darren. I'm sorry I wasn't able to join earlier. Yeah, now that now that Darren's here, I'm going to pass the baton on to to Darren to facilitate. Um, do you want to, Darren? Do you want to call on folks with their hands up, or do you want me to do it? No, that's fine, Leanne. I can take over. And, and Jamie, uh, my apologies again for being late, um, and I'm happy to fill in. So I see a couple of hands. Let's start with Stephen Batchelder, please. Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, thank you. My my question was on the low percentage of people that were undetectable. Uh, and, and, and I'm just curious, what action steps have you taken? Are they the same as they would be in other communities? Yeah, um, there's, so a lot of uh, folk that um, 
our API who like there's a low percentage of undetectability. Um, there's been a lot of um, so what we've done over here in uh, the Oakland area, there's been a lot of um, creation of things like support groups so that um, you can get all the people who are of API like in the community living with HIV together. That way they can discuss these things. Um, we've also held uh, education workshops in uh, various languages. Uh, so like Cantonese, Mandarin, Vietnamese, uh, what have not. Um, something new that has um, been coming up uh, is there's, uh, we've been hiring a lot more um, staff members who can speak multiple languages. Mm -hmm. And so um, that way they can also relate together. Um, on my staff here, we have two of our case managers living with HIV. Um, we have a few case managers that has substance use um, disorder uh, using meth, cocaine, alcohol. Um, we have uh, people uh, on our team that live with depression and anxiety. Uh, as well and see like a therapist. And so being able to use that and um, help them pa help make the patient more comfortable um, with like their care, feeling better about themselves, normalizing um, HIV and being able to uh, help them understand that it's okay uh, and relate, uh, that has been, probably the biggest uh, factor in helping uh, up our numbers. Thank you. Yeah, did I answer your question? Yes, yes, you gave me some good information, yes. Okay. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, Catherine, go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Jamie, thank you for the uh, great presentation and sharing your story and everything. I felt like I related a lot to a lot of the cases that you mentioned. Um, you actually answered quite a few of my questions with uh, Stevens. Um, I guess something that I'm curious about is how you're able to kind of break barriers with patients when you're like one-on-one -on -one with them. Um, I've had a problem in which I have had patients who like have a history of STIs, which puts them at higher risk of like contracting HIV and they're not receptive to receiving PrEP. Or I've had patients who um, come through and are um, don't want, to, like you've said, don't want to talk about like their sexual history or like harm reduction or things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you, Think that there are any methods that are particularly effective when talking with patients about these things? Yeah, um, usually what I do is um, I let them drive in terms of um, letting them take the conversation and letting t uh, them like uh, like lead. Um, like I'll ask like open-ended questions in terms of like, tell me about um, what's been going on or tell me about um, the uh, S the STIs, tell me about like uh, last sexual encounter. Um, it puts it in a way where instead of having like the patient ha um, like giving you a yes or no answer or like having to decline, it makes it so that the patient has like this open-ended field. That way they can drive like the conversation. Um, I also noticed too that a lot of the times, sometimes you won't get that, um, everything that you need in one session. Um, so with some patients, it'll take a few times, like uh, five to 10 times. Sometimes it might take 20 times before you can actually figure out, okay, this is what's actually going on. Um, I actually have a patient who uh, constantly gets, has been getting STIs. Um, she's a very young um, Chinese lady and um, we actually suspect that she um, has some like sex trafficking going on, but we're not sure. 
but like each time when she answers us, um, like in the past, it would be, oh, like, are you, uh, are you feeling safe? Uh, what's going on? Uh, like, is, uh, like, how are you getting all this money to buy these expensive, like, um, luxury brand bags? Uh, and so um, she would say, oh, no, like, nothing's going on. I'm feeling safe. But eventually, as um, we kept asking, like, the questions in different ways, um, she opened up and was able, uh, we were able to figure out, oh, like she really was um, being sex trafficked and this was what was actually going on. Uh, so like asking questions in different ways, um, op like leaving it an open playing field for the patient um, and then normalizing things for the patient. If you have like anyone that can relate to the patient, it really, really helps. Thank you. Barry, uh, did you have your hand up or did I miss see that? Hi, Darren, thanks. I did have my hand up, but I put it down because oh. Jamie partially answered it, but I actually wanted to expand a little bit. Um, Catherine asked about prep, but I, I wanted to ask a little bit more explicitly about um, method excuse me, messaging prep, what it is with specific um, segments of the population, particularly uh, younger, um, API, gay, identified in MSM. Yeah, um, messaging, like getting the message out there about prep. Yeah, like what is it, who, who can, you know, what is it, how do you get it, um, yeah. In particular ways that you think for API MSM might be important and unique for them. And I was yeah. just looking at some of your data uh, from some of your early earlier slides, and that's why I'm pinpointing M young MSM. Um, so we've done um, like we've done brochures uh, in different languages before. Um, I've actually held uh, some support groups uh, or gone into different places like, for example, um, there's something called Discord or Slack. Um, they have uh, specific like groups that are for like the gay Asian community or uh, the lesbian Asian community. Um, and sometimes like there's discussion regarding um, prep and uh, whatnot there. And so we would hold, uh, like get together, hold something, have some food, talk about uh, these things uh, together. Um, some other stuff that we have done is uh, um, doing a mural. So like painting a mural, uh, or finding a place to put a mural where people can actually see, um, like having artists, like commission the artists and um, designing something that represents like the community. Um, because it's, there's more likeliness of uptake of PrEP and uh, willingness to take PrEP when someone is able to relate, oh, this, is, this person looks like me um type of thing and so we've had um that done um we've also gone to various events uh that are hosted by the different uh, asian communities so like for example um uh back in february lunar new year um uh, usually the vietnamese and chinese community uh celebrate that um uh, among some of the other asians and we would do things like outreach, like uh, prep outreach, uh, explaining that we'd have a booth uh, out there. Um, and so just like different things of that nature. So we've done that. Um, did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Thank you very much. I'm particularly um, struck by the mural concept. I think that that's an interesting idea, both direct and indirect, about messaging 
Yeah, actually, we've also designed um, sweatshirts uh, or like book bags and things like that as well. Um, I am part of the uh, consulting team for East Bay Getting to Zero, uh, which designs um, technically for all of the community. Uh, but uh, there's something called uh, East Bay Love. And um, we have like this um, picture of like a condom uh, that's open uh, or uh, we have like a pill where it looks like a prep pill. Um, we also have um, a, sir a syringe with like a Band-Aid uh, so that we can spread awareness of like COVID, like getting your COVID vaccine. Thank you. Jamie, I have a question from uh, the chat from somebody. If you had a chance to offer a piece of advice to your younger self during your diagnosis in 2020, what would it be? Um, so I, that's a question, hard question. <laughs> um, <laughs> so <Sorry. laughs> uh, I actually am one of the case managers that have a substance use disorder. I also suffer from depression and anxiety. Um, I think probably to know that like, yes, I'm gonna be making mistakes um, and some of that will probably mess with my life. Um, but to not be so hard on myself all the time, um, because when I'm hard on myself like all the time and with like, like contracting HIV, um, it, like it doesn't do me any good. It doesn't do anyone any good. Uh, and so being kinder to myself and letting, like being okay with, okay, it's like, this is what happened. What can I do in order to help other people so that I don't, um, so that they don't repeat the same mistakes that I did? Wow, that's a powerful answer. Thank you so much. Uh, we have about five minutes, give or take. I want to do a last call. To, oh, Stephen, you have a question? By all means, go ahead. Um, talk, talking about, yes, thank you. Um, talking about PrEP, it made me think about injectables. <laughs> and I wonder if you think injectables will be a benefit for PrEP or for other uh, people living with HIV when it becomes more available. Uh, yes, actually. Um, I really like the idea of the injectable, um, partially because some of my patients historically are horrible at taking their tablets. And so I'm always chasing after them. Hey, can we get your labs? Hey, what's going on with your tablets? Hey, um, have you taken your medication? Um, I actually am part of the team that wrote the protocol for Cabinuva um, for our organization. And I will be writing the protocol for Apertude. Um, shortly, uh, I actually think that the uh, injectable will help with not just adherence, um, but it'll do wonders in making people feel like, oh, I'm not having to take a pill every day. It's not reminding them, like, in their hand, like, they don't see it in their face. Oh, like, I have HIV. I got diagnosed with HIV. Um, it's just a monthly, well, actually, a uh, month, every other month now, injection. Well, the day will be, it's, it's monthly, I think. Um, yeah, uh, I know um, the FDA just approved uh, Cabinuva for every other month. And so um, we've been pulling our, um, like our patients, some of our patients that are on it and asking them if they want to um, switch to the every other month. Uh, that way they don't have to get the injection every month. Leanne, you're up and I think we'll end with you. Yeah, um, I just wanted to piggyback off of the questions about the injectables to say um, that we'll also have a speaker from CRI um, coming in May to discuss the injectables, um, just to compare the two and to um, discuss how it 
its effectiveness, um, as well as uh, kind of insurance and, and access issues. And so stay tuned for that. And then secondly, I just want to thank Jamie. Um, thank you so much for giving us your time, your expertise, um, sharing your personal story. Um, this is just, again, I don't think the Planning Council has had a presentation um, specifically about the API community. I might be wrong, um, but it's just really wonderful to, to have you here and to be able to get this information. So thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Hopefully it helps like uh, everyone. I know I was very nervous. So <laughs> we, are, we are super friendly and Jamie, I'll echo uh, Leanne's comments. Thank you so much for sharing your story and giving us better insight. This is not something we've heard much about. So mm. I'm really, really grateful we were able to have you here. Um, yeah, awesome presentation. I like the yeah. way you have let's break some glass and you went through everything. That was awesome. <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, and Jamie, we do have um, uh, a little bit more business to take care of. You are welcome to stay. You're also welcome to drop. I will leave that to you. And uh, thank you again.